Well, I am the youngest of four boys in my family, and so growing up with three older brothers, you can probably imagine that we could make a little bit of a mess in our house, specifically really um, boys' rooms, can get a little messy. And because there are four of us, a lot of times we would end up having to share a room. And because I was the youngest, that would always be uh, my room is the one that was shared. And so um, with two kids in a room, it's not just a little mess anymore. It's a lot of mess. It's, it's twice as messy, really. And my parents, they had, they had the same challenge that, that pretty much all parents have is where, you know, trying to get your kids to clean up their room or do some chores. It can be a little challenging sometimes. And in my situation, specifically when it comes to cleaning my room, my solution was always the closet. Uh, It was just out of the way. You couldn't see what was in there. So I would open the door. I would just bulldoze everything on the floor into the closet. And my room was magically cleaned. It worked really well for me. I knew exactly where everything was. It was in the closet somewhere in a mountain of other things. Um, and so if you're, if you're a parent, this may sound a little bit familiar, this particular scenario. If you give your kids a task to do or maybe a chore to do and you sort of set them loose on it and you go about doing some other things and you finally come back to check on them and they are doing anything but what you've asked them to do. Maybe they're playing with the toys that they're supposed to be cleaning up or maybe they're just sitting there or laying there doing nothing at all. And that was, uh, that was a lot of times what would find where, where my parents would find us. And so we always had these great excuses as to why we couldn't do what we were supposed to be doing. Uh, a lot of times for me, it, it was based on my dependence on someone else because I could play that youngest card. Either, either I needed my parents' help with something or, you know, my brothers, they had to finish what they were doing so that I could then do what I was doing, right? They had to finish their task first. So I became a little bit uh, of a procrastinator and and I became really, really good at it. And But there was a phrase that my dad would always use when we would encounter a situation like that or he would find us really putting something off instead of continuing working. Uh, And this is what he would say. He would say, do what you can now, do what you can't later. Do what you can now, do what you can't later. In other words, you don't have to stop the entire process just because you can't complete this one piece of the task. There are other things that you can be doing now. You can move on to the next thing. There's plenty to be done. You can come back to this later when you have the help that you need. So so there's really no excuse just to be waiting around doing nothing on this one particular thing. And so you've, you've probably found yourself maybe in a similar situation in life where you find yourself just putting something off or waiting to do something. Maybe there's a decision that you're waiting to get more information on. Maybe it's a decision that you really have enough information, but you just want all of the information before you make that decision. You want all of the possible details. Or, or maybe, maybe you're putting off a decision or putting off doing something because honestly, you're just not motivated enough to make it a priority, which was probably the case for us cleaning our rooms and stuff. Uh, Or or maybe, maybe for you, it's that you're frozen in fear of doing the wrong thing or or making the wrong decision and, and messing something up as a result of it. But for whatever reason, we find ourselves in these situations where we don't have a clear next step in front of us that we know to take. And so the question that we're gonna ask is what do we do in those situations in life. And last, last week we started a series called Charting the Course. Charting the Course. And in this series, we're sort of taking a look at the disciples, at the followers of Jesus, and the weeks following Easter, where they just encountered this time where they weren't exactly sure of what was coming next and what to do next. And in this, we, we can sort of see how they determined their path Forward. And so last week we established really just this starting point of our course and, and of our personal journeys and, and how it's all really tied to the resurrection, how the resurrection is really the, the common anchor for all believers that we can tie everything to. And no matter where we go from there, it gives us something to tie into. And then after the resurrection, Jesus comes and he gives his disciples uh, the, this underlying mission. He, he said, your mission is really to share the message of God's love and forgiveness that comes through 
me. And so wherever they went and whatever they did and whoever they encountered, they were to share that mission of God's love and God's forgiveness that comes through Jesus. And so Luke, who's the author of the book of Luke that we looked at the last chapter last week, is also uh, the author of the book of Acts. And we talked about the fact that Luke wasn't one of the disciples, but he was really more of a journalistic reporter. And he, he interviewed the, the lives of the people who were close to Jesus and who had experienced uh, life with Jesus. And then he recorded the things that he learned from them. And so then he also, he wrote the book of Luke. He also wrote the book of Acts. And, and Acts really is, is a book that explains everything that happened after Jesus's time on earth there with the early church. And here's how he starts the book of Acts. He says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, he had chosen. So he starts in my former book. He, he, he really is, is giving a little bit of a recap. It's kind of like when you watch a TV show or a TV series and it, and it jumps back to some of the previous episodes and shows you these clips of what went, what went on there so that you're reminded of where you are in the story. And, and Luke is writing to Theophilus, who may have been this important dignitary. He may actually have been someone who hired Luke to, to really do this investigative reporting and this journaling to figure out, hey, what is the story with Jesus and his followers? And, and so he's writing to Theophilus. He says, hey, let me remind you everything that I wrote in my last book, you know, everything about Jesus and the things that he taught and the things that he did and the things that he said and, and not, and he did all those. Uh, and then he gave his, uh, his disciples some instructions before, before he ascended, before he went up into heaven, he gave his disciples some instructions. And, and really let's dig into this. Let's, let's see what this looked like and what this played out there at the very end. He says, after suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. He says, so if you remember, if you remember uh, after Jesus' suffering, you know, he died on the cross, he rose again, but the disciples, for whatever reason, they didn't get it. They didn't believe that he was alive and he had to come in and show them all these proofs and remind them that, hey, this was always the plan from the beginning. I've been trying to tell you guys this and you just don't believe Anyway, so, so he tries to explain to them this. He finally convinces them that it is him, that he is alive, that it is a part of God's plan. And then he's trying to tell them about the kingdom of heaven, about sort of this upside down kingdom where the first are last and the last are first and where, where the, the masters serve the servants, the greatest serve the least, right? And it's this upside down kingdom. It's different than what they would expect. And so he's just reminding them, hey, you've got this purpose You've got this plan. There's this mission that I have for you of what I want you to do while you're here on this earth. But then, but then it was time for Jesus to leave them. And so he'd given them these sort of long range instructions, but before he leaves, he gives them this very short instruction of what to do next. He says this, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus said, what you need to do next, I've given you these long-term goals, but what you need to do next is just go to Jerusalem and stay there and wait. Because something important is going to happen. And it couldn't be while I'm still here, I'm going to be gone, but you need to wait in Jerusalem for something important to happen. And so God is ready to do something in your lives. And he's, here's what he's going to do. He's going to send a gift. He's going to send the Holy Spirit. And this was probably very confusing to the disciples. And actually, it, even today, it's, it's confusing to a lot of people what that actually means, right? What does it mean to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? You know, we, we've seen people baptized in water. We get that. But, but what does it mean? What happens when someone is baptized in the Holy Spirit. They, they had no concept for that, but they would find out soon. And actually, that's something we're going we're gonna to look at a little bit next week as the story continues. It says, and, and, and while Jesus really was trying to give them these instructions, he was trying to tell the disciples what was coming next, uh, it's obviously that they were a little distracted, that, that they were still sort of hung up on earthly kingdoms and not the kingdom 
of God, and they were, they were trying to figure out how the Messiah, how Jesus was still going to meet their expectations and do the things that they wanted them wanted him to do. You know, when was, when was he going to complete their agenda? And so they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And really, it's just after Jesus has said this about, hey, the Father's going to send you this gift. He's going to send you the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's, it's like they're going, hey, that sounds nice. That sounds great. Um, but if you're leaving, right, it's, it's got to it's gotta be to go take over the government, right? You're going to go uh, just show your power. Um, you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel, right? Because that's what we're expecting you to do. And, and when, when is it that we're going to get out of Roman rule? When, when are we going to get our country back with our own leaders and our own rules, right? En- enough of this humble and lowly stuff, like let's put God back on top. And, and I, think, I think they were even passing out red hats that said, make Israel great again. I think that's part of the story that happened. Uh, but now Jesus, like they're, they're asking these questions and Jesus is thinking, guys, guys, you just still don't get it, do you? After everything we've been through, after everything you've seen, after you saw me die and come back to life and I'm giving you this mission, you still don't see the big picture of what's happening. And so he reminds them, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the father has set by his own authority. Guys, stop trying to concern yourself with those things. Stop trying to, to get the sideways energy. I've given you something to do, right? You, you don't need to know and you don't need to concern yourself with that. Your task, your immediate task is not connected to the nation of Israel. It's not connected to a country. It's not connected to a kingdom here on earth. It's connected to the kingdom of of God. Look, the Father's going to decide. He'll take care of all the rest of those things. You don't need to worry about that. It is under His command. It is under His rule. It is under His authority to decide when, when those things will happen. And when He is ready to do that, He'll take care of that. You guys aren't going to have to worry about that. But here's what you do need to be concerned with. He says, but you will receive power When the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and all the and to all the ends of the earth. He says the gift, the gift the father has promised you will give you power. The father has authority, but he's going to give you power, but not power to accomplish your agenda, not power to accomplish your goals. It's power to accomplish my agenda, to accomplish my mission. You remember that mission, right? To to share the love of God and the message of forgiveness of sins that comes through me. That is your mission. That is what you need to be concerned with. And by the way, there are a lot of people that you need to share that message with. It's no longer just this small group. It's, It's everyone in the world needs to hear this message. And that is what you need to be concerned with. It's God's kingdom. It's not your kingdom. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. So the last thing that Jesus says before he ascends into heaven is stay on mission. Remember what your mission is. And the disciples, I imagine, are just standing there sort of watching Jesus like like you watch a balloon that floats off, sort of looking up. Like, I think I still see it. Is, Is that it? over there, and, and it says that eventually a cloud hid him from their sight, which makes sense, right? Because, because Jesus couldn't just continue to float up. There's not like a cloud elevator that gets you up to heaven. I imagine at some point he just had to disappear completely and go to wherever it is that heaven is located, right? It's not just going up into the sky and eventually, you know, you reach that floor and you're there. But the disciples, they're just there, just looking around, just still trying to see where is he? Where did he go? They're trying to find him. It says this, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood besides them. And these these men that it says, again, they're probably angels. They are probably messengers from God, but they, they appear as men. You get the feeling that God was sort of done with the winged angels, sort of the shock and awe 
approach, the, the scariness really that, that that brought, but you know, that was maybe more for grabbing people's attention, maybe introducing something new to them, uh, something that was going to be difficult for them to believe. But here, just like at the tomb with the women, God just sends two men who are well-dressed, uh, and, he, and he sends them really for, in both situations just as a reminder. So they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. They say, hey, hey guys, what are you doing? Like, what are you looking for? Why are you just continuing to watch the sky? Didn't, didn't the, the person that just took off and float into the sky, didn't he give you a task? Didn't he give you something to do, right? How long are you just going to stand there watching to see what happened? Kind of reminds me of when I give my children a task to, to clean the house or something along those lines. And I, I set them loose and I take off and I come back. And for whatever reason, they have just found themselves off task. And I have to remind them, hey, like quit playing with the toys, put the toys away. And I guess, I guess they get that honestly, um, probably from their mother's side of the family, definitely not from mine. Um, but these two men, right, these two men, they go back and they say, hey, guys, just get back on task. There is something for you to do. And so then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, which was a Sabbath day's walk from the city. So the Mount of Olives is just a, a little ways out of the city. And so they go back to Jerusalem from where he ascended. And a Sabbath day's walk, just if you're curious, is about 3,000 feet. It's a little over half a mile, and, and that distance really was established when, when the Jews uh, were, were in the wilderness and they had the tabernacle, that, and the law was given. That distance was established because that's how far the tabernacle was from the outermost tents. And so they had to be allowed to walk that far on the Sabbath day so that they could go to the tabernacle and worship. And, and so that's, that's how that number came to be. And so the disciples, they began to follow the instructions. They went back to Jerusalem and they did what Jesus said. And so what Jesus had said, their immediate task was they stayed there waiting. They stayed there waiting. So we talk about charting the course in our personal journeys, in our own lives. Sometimes we find ourselves in a season of waiting. That normally comes maybe when we're, we're anticipating or, or considering some type of change that's coming up in our lives. And while we're trying to, think, uh, we're trying to find out uh, what the next steps are going to be in our journey, but we're often unsure of what or when that might be. So the question, the question that we, we're going to circle back to is this, what do you do in the waiting? What do you do in the waitings? And, and sometimes in our lives, we find ourselves waiting for something that we know is coming, right? Uh, something that we know is coming. The details are set. The date is, is out there. We know when it's going to happen. It's just somewhere out in the future. It could be something exciting. Uh, it could be something like a vacation or a trip that we're going to take. It could be uh, maybe a big move that's coming for your family. It could be maybe just a special event or, or you know, a a concert or maybe maybe even your wedding like that was a pretty big thing that you found yourself waiting for sometimes before before you get married right you once you get the who and the when set the rest is relatively easy to figure out when it comes to waiting for those types of things you know exactly what to plan for but sometimes sometimes we find ourselves planning for the unknown maybe the question is you know hey what what college what college am I go to and, and what's going to be my major what what job am I going to get? What, what city or what state even am I going to live in? Or maybe it's, when am I going to meet the person that I'm going to marry? And, and who is that person going to be? Or maybe later in life, you get, you get the itch to, to maybe change careers or relocate to a different city or a different state, but you aren't sure of when or where or what that will look like, right? Or maybe, maybe sometimes Sometimes our waiting is a little bit less exciting for us. Maybe it's less exciting of an unknown. Maybe, maybe it's even a scary one for us. Like, is this relationship going to last? Are we going to make it? Or maybe it's what happens, what happens now after this diagnosis? 
What's going to be the end result of that? Maybe it's, is the money going to run out? Either, either in a business that you're a part of, or maybe it's in your personal finances. Are we going to, are we going to make this? What's going to happen down the road? So the disciples, they found themselves in this time of waiting, sort of, sort of in between those two situations where they, they knew their long-term task, they knew sort of what that would look like, but they didn't, know, uh, they didn't know what their immediate future would look like. They had their underlying mission, but they didn't know what was going to happen next in their waiting. They didn't know when the gift of the Holy Spirit was going to show up that the Father had promised, and they certainly didn't know what was going to happen when it did. There was plenty of unknowns in their situation. And, and as we look at how they responded, we can pull some principles of how we can respond when we find ourselves in our own time of waiting. And, and even if you're not a Jesus follower, you can find some of the principles that they put into place helpful. You can, you can put some of those same things into practice. You can apply some of those principles into your own life, regardless of what you believe about Jesus or what you believe about God, you can find some of this helpful. So let's look. Let's look at how they responded. First thing it says is they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And so when you find yourself in the waiting, the first thing they did is the first thing that I would encourage you to do, and this is specifically for Jesus followers or people who believe in God, and that is to pray to seek God, to ask for His guidance, to ask for His direction. When you are considering a change, when you are anticipating something different coming, you your first move should be to ask God and to pray to God what He wants you to do in that situation. But the disciples, they didn't just pray individually. They didn't just hang out by themselves and pray alone. It says that they gathered together in prayer. So they surrounded themselves with a group of people who shared their same vision, who shared their same values, and they sought God together. And so the next thing that I would say that you should do if you're in this time of waiting is to invite others into the conversation with you, to find some people that you trust, that have uh, similar values to you, that, that maybe have knowledge or experience on this path that you're considering going down, and invite their input into their lives, and then listen to what they have to say. And that's what the disciples did. They all joined together, and they sort of talked about what they should do next, and, and they prayed to God and asked Him to give guidance. But don't let it go unnoticed. Don't let it go unnoticed that Luke pointed out that, that some of Jesus' family was there, right? His, it says that His mother, Mary, was there, and, and that's sort of easy to, to figure out. You know, Mary had been there from the beginning, her whole experience was miraculous. With the conception, like she knew Jesus was the Son of God. She knew there was something special about Him from the beginning. It's, it's easy for her to believe in Him, right? Lot, lots of parents think that their kids hung the moon, but hers actually did. But Jesus' brothers, that's a whole different story. What would it take for you to convince your brother that you were the Son of of God. I've got three older brothers, and I would think they had all lost their mind if they tried to tell me that, right? But Jesus' brothers believed that he was the Son of God, and that fact alone speaks volumes to the argument that really this could be true. Maybe he is who he says he is. And so, all together with the disciples and Jesus' families and all the other believers, that were there. There's about 100 and peop 120 people that were gathered together, meeting together, praying and seeking God. And, and one day as they're doing this, Peter stands up and um, he begins to tell the story of Judas and what happened to Judas after he had betrayed Jesus and, and, and even up to the point of his death. And, and he says that his death really sort of has left a vacancy in the disciples and in, in that group of 12 of the, the original disciples. And so using scripture, he sort of explains what happens, and then he comes up with this conclusion. He says, therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. Peter says, hey, 
hey, I know that we're supposed to be waiting. I know that we're in this time of waiting or waiting for for when God's going to send this gift to us. But, But there's something we can do in the waiting. We need to choose a replacement for Judas. We need someone to take his spot, right? But that person, there needs to be certain criteria that they need to meet. They need to have been there from the very beginning, from from the time that he was baptized in the wilderness, and they need to have been present the entire time all the way to his death and even his ascension, right? They have to be present for all of that. And and that probably, if you imagine if there's 120 people, that, that probably eliminated some really good options of who they could have chosen because maybe some people were gone for part of the time or weren't there early on or or, you know, after Jesus died, they sort of, you know, snuck away for a little while and, and weren't there. Um, but, G, but Peter says, hey, there's, there's a really good reason that we need someone who's been here this whole time. And, and this is the reason, because uh, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And so if you study Jewish law, there are guidelines for who can be considered a witness. The, the first rule uh, for testimony is that for a testimony to be valid, there had to be two witnesses. So one person was not enough. There had to be two people saying the same thing. And so that could be a reason, really, if you think about it, that at the tomb and, and after his ascension, that God sent two men, two messengers, two angels, uh, instead of just one. Because with two people, there was a valid testimony there. And when they told the women, hey, he's risen, because there were two people there, that became a valid testimony. Uh, on top of that, really considering the women, um, a witness in the Jewish culture could not be a woman. A woman could not serve as a witness. That was part of their culture. It had to be a man. And, and that may also explain why when the women came back from the tomb and told the disciples what they had seen and what they had heard, that the disciples didn't believe them, right? That their testimony wasn't valid to them because They were women, and so the men had to go and see for themselves. So furthermore, a a witness, uh, they they have to have a personal experience in the matter, right? Which is why it was important that they would be there from the whole time, from the very beginning in the wilderness and the baptism, all the way to the time of his death and resurrection and ascension, right? To be a witness with the 12, they had to be there the entire time that the 12 were there. Right. And, and, and here's one thing that's really unique, really interesting about how witnesses worked in the Jewish culture. If, if you had two witnesses saying the same thing, that was enough to counterbalance a group that was much larger than them. So there could be a hundred people saying one thing. And if you had two people, just two people saying something different, then you had to consider what they were saying as a possible valid option. And so if the disciples were preparing to go out and share this message and give their testimony as witnesses of what had happened with Jesus, just like they had before, likely they would go out in pairs. And with two of them, they had to be taken seriously. They could counterbalance any group that was saying anything against or arguing against what they would say. And so that, might, that may be why Peter felt, hey, we need to add a 12th disciple back. We need to find another disciple so that we can go out in pairs, and our testimony will be valid. And so they began this process of selection. So so they nominated two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. So they came up with two solid options that met the criteria for what they were looking for. It says, then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belonged. And so they choose their two options, and then they pray to God, Hey God, show us which one of these two men you want to fill Judas' spot. Show us, show us your guy. And then what they do next, really, maybe it's just me, but I find it a little surprising and I also find it a little amusing. It says, Then they cast Lot, and the Lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. So they prayed and asked God, God, show us your guy, you know, give us your wisdom, let us know what to do, which one of these two men to choose, and then they leave it up to the roll of the dice. They leave it up to a game 
of chance, right? It would be like for us, like going, all right, God, show us who you want, uh, flip a coin, heads or tails, and then we make that decision. So it's it's just a little comical to me. And to be fair, this was a very common practice back in that time, but in my opinion, at least, it just doesn't seem like the most spiritual way of making this type of decision. But God used this decision anyway. And, and so if you go, hey, God, show us your guy. Show us who you want to pick. How are we going to know? Uh, let's just a random game of chance, right? It just doesn't seem that spiritual. But when there are two equally good options, a dice roll or a coin flip may not be that bad of a method of choosing which one to go with, right? You can still trust God with the outcome either way. But I would not rest, uh, necessarily recommend that same method if you've got two options that aren't quite equal. For instance, if, you're, if your choice is between uh, just quitting your job and living on faith or you know, keeping your job until you know a solid next step to take, I probably would not just flip a coin to make that decision, right? I wouldn't leave that up to chance, especially especially if you have other people or family who are all dependent on you. And here's the deal. I'm not saying that God can't ask those things of you or can't lead you to do those certain things, but I personally would want more, uh, more deciding that than just a game of chance, more than a coin flip. I would, I would want more input from God, but what we can get out of this, what we can get out of how the disciples took this approach is that they didn't just sit idly by while they were waiting, right? They, they couldn't go anywhere, but it didn't mean that they couldn't do anything. They knew their mission. They knew what was going to come. So they did what they could to get ready for it, even while they were waiting. In the words of my dad, do what you can now and do what you can't later. Right? Just, because, just because you find yourself waiting on something doesn't mean that you can't start preparing for what that might be. So take what you know. Take what you know and work with that. And if you feel like God is maybe leading you in a certain direction, but you don't have the green light yet for whatever reason, Start preparing anyway. Like investigate it, learn about it, read about it, talk to other people about it. And in that preparing, you might just find some clarity. You may find that that was a terrible idea, and that's definitely not part of God's plan for you. But you also might just find that God is using that to strengthen your desire to move in that direction. And so back to our question. What should you do? What should you do when you find yourself in a time of waiting? And what steps can you take when you're uncertain of which direction to move next? You do what you can now. There are two things, two things that you can always do in waiting. The first is pray, just like the disciples. Spend time seeking God and asking God to show you somehow, to reveal to you somehow, or to guide you somehow into what you are to do next, to give you some sort of direction. The second thing you can do is surround yourself with people and invite other people into that conversation who can talk you through that, who can counsel you through that, who can share their wisdom with you. And then, when you've done those things and maybe you find that next possible step that you feel like maybe this is the direction that you're supposed to go, ask yourself a next question. What can you do now? If you can't go all the way yet, what is it that you can do to help you prepare for later? Just because you don't have the green light, just because you're still in the waiting doesn't mean that you can't start preparing. So investigate that option. Learn about that option. And the more you investigate and the more you learn, go back to those first few steps of praying and getting counsel from others with those things. Because if you, if you wait actively, proactively, doing something in the waiting, that when the time finally comes, you may just find 
that when you're ready to make, make, uh, take that next step, instead of waiting on God, if you're not ready, you'll just be waiting on yourself. So do things in the waiting. Seek God in the waiting. Be active in the waiting so that when it takes time, when the time comes to take that next step, you're ready. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for who you are, God. And God, I know all of us here have been at one point, probably at several points in our life in, in one form of waiting or another, God. And while it's never easy and while sometimes it's, it's very unclear, God, we thank you that you offer guidance, you offer direction, God, that you can surround us with people who can speak into our lives. God, so just help us to be people who seek you and who seek the counsel of others and the wisdom that comes from others, God. And while we're in those times of waiting, God, that we wouldn't stop seeking you, that we wouldn't stop chasing after you, God, that we would do the best that we can to prepare ourselves so that when you give us that next step, we are ready to move. In your name we pray.